and let, there. Good morning. Um, I want to welcome everyone here for uh, and convene the Subcommittee on Communications and Technology in this hearing on cybersecurity threats to communication networks and public sector responses. Heeding the call of the House Republican Cybersecurity Task Force appointed by the Speaker, this subcommittee has embarked on a series of hearings, as most of you are aware, to get a complete picture of the cybersecurity challenges that face our nation. Today is the third of our hearings on this topic, and having already heard from witnesses in our previous hearings on the concerns of the private sector security firms helping to secure communications networks from cyber threats, as well as the network operators that must protect their networks while providing the broadband services that have become the fuel of our economy. Those hearings, I think, provided us with a lot of very, very valuable information. We appreciate the witnesses who testified. This hearing continues our subcommittee's review of cybersecurity issues with a focus on the public sector. In order to further investigate the complex issues that surround any discussion of cybersecurity, I recently asked a number of my subcommittee colleagues to serve on a bipartisan working group tasked with gathering additional information. My Vice Chairman Lee Terry and Ranking Member uh, Eshu have graciously served as co-chairs of that working group for the last few weeks, and I am very appreciative of their work. The group also included Representatives Doyle, Matsui, Kinzinger, and Latta. The members of the working group and their staffs have met with a number of industry stakeholders, and throughout their discussions, a consistent theme has emerged, the need for the government and private sector to work together to address cybersecurity. The findings of the working group are consistent with the message we have heard in our hearings on this matter from the private sector perspective. Today we hear from some of the agencies within our government that are working to meet these threats both in terms of what is being done to promote cybersecurity as well as how we can better secure our nation's communications networks. In this hearing, we are privileged to have five witnesses that represent parts of the government that work to address the complex cybersecurity issues our country faces every day. The work being done by these government agencies to help address cybersecurity is just the tip of the iceberg of what we can achieve when our private sector innovation and public sector resources are put to common task. That is why I am a co-sponsor of H.R. 3523, which is the Cyber Intelligence Sharing and Protection Act, this bipartisan bill introduced by my communications and technology colleague and chairman of the uh, House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, Mike Rogers. H.R. 3523 makes common sense changes to the way our government and private sector share cyber intelligence without compromising either the commercial broadband providers or the integrity of the intelligence community. Similarly, the good work being done by industry stakeholders at the FCC on the Communication Security Reliability and Interoperability Council, or CISRIC, to bring voluntary best practices to bear on the security of commercial networks is another example of the type of public-private cooperation that I think will achieve results without mandates. It looks very similar to the Australian model that received favorable reviews at uh, one of our previous hearings. To remain nimble and effective, codes of conduct like these should remain voluntary and should involve all stakeholders in the Internet ecosystem, not just the ISPs. In addition to hearing from these agencies on the good work they are doing, I also expect to hear how you think we can improve the cooperation between the Federal Government and private industry as uh, they work to combat cyber threats. Having heard from the private sector, today's public sector perspective will give the members of the subcommittee a more complete picture of the cybersecurity landscape. I thank the panelists for your testimony today. I look forward to a lively discussion of these issues. And with that, I would yield the remainder of my time to uh, the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Terry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, certainly uh, quite a learning curve from both the ta uh, Speaker's Task Force and uh, the Task Force that uh, Anna and I have been uh, uh, lucky enough to uh, oversee. But this is a real threat to our economy and to our country. and we need to uh, really start thinking seriously about ways of securing our communications networks. Um, and in that discussion, uh, not only how, but who should be part of that process. And first, I want to commend the Communication Security and Reliability Interoperability Council, or CISRIC, for its recent report outlining voluntary best practices that industry has agreed to implement and ISPs engaging in the anti-bot code of conduct and domain name system best practices, as well as working to develop a framework to prevent IP route hijacking is a great start to improving our overall health and safety of our nation's uh, networks and limiting uh, access for attacks. But I'm confident that this collaboration will continue uh, to improve. 
I will state for the record that I have uh, some uh, reservations concerning uh, giving government agencies like Department of Homeland Security authority for overseeing or implementing the standards. Uh, a, I think we need to focus on flexibility, and secondly, uh, that department hasn't provided me the level of confidence that I'd want to turn over our cybersecurity to them. Uh, all we have to do is walk into our airports and uh, visualize uh, my lack of confidence in them. So at this point, I'll yield back, and I'm uh, anxious to hear from the uh, witnesses. Now recognize the gentlelady from California, my friend Ms. Eshoo, for opening statements. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning to uh, all of my colleagues on the subcommittee, and welcome to uh, our witnesses. Thank you for being willing to uh, be here today to uh, uh, instruct us even um, uh, uh, further on this whole uh, issue of uh, uh, cybersecurity, that we've had a very important uh, series of, uh, of hearings, and uh, they have been very, very helpful. Uh, they've been outstanding hearings, and uh, uh, both sides of the aisle, I think, uh, have agreed on that. Um, uh, as has been stated, I'm part of the, um, uh, the Cybersecurity Working Group with uh, Congressman Terry, and uh, 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 through the process that we have followed, our staff has, uh, um, collective staff, uh, have gathered information from key stakeholders and uh, been focusing on uh, issues such as the supply chain integrity, uh, information sharing, consumer education, and our subcommittees, uh, obviously our subcommittee's jurisdiction uh, in these areas. We've uh, learned that uh, advanced persistent threats, the APTs, post a significant uh, uh, risk to our communications uh, uh, infrastructure. Uh, and these sophisticated threats are often either state-sponsored or pursued by criminal enterprises, and they have the potential to lead to significant theft or manipulation of data and other uh, malicious activities. So we have our hands full, uh, most frankly, about how to go uh, at this. Uh, fortunately, there are experts uh, uh, like each one of you uh, that are working hard uh, really diligently to uh, protect our country from cyber threats. So we really look forward to hearing what you uh, uh, can uh, instruct us uh, 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 on this. And uh, I, I want to especially welcome Mr. Hutchinson from the uh, uh, from Sandia National Labs uh, Adaptive Network Countermeasures. Wow, these are real mouthfuls, I'll tell you. The ANC, um, uh, the DHS efforts concerning domain name server security extension and the FCC's uh, recent recommendations from uh, CISRAC, uh, all of these uh, uh, need to be stitched together. Uh, uh, we can't afford to have to uh, go into um, uh, an enlightened uh, endeavor and uh, end up with silos all over again. I'm very sensitive about that, having uh, uh, been a veteran of uh, of the, uh, of the House Intelligence Committee. So uh, I think to deter uh, cyber criminals, we need to have a, a, a really well-coordinated, comprehensive effort that's going to promote uh, R&D, consumer education, supply chain integrity, and information, and yet ensure at the same time that we, the, we uh, speak to privacy and civil uh, liberties uh, protections. I, I think it's also important that uh, uh, we don't uh, uh, take any actions that would inadvertently hinder the private sector development of uh, cybersecurity technology or create new uh, network uh, vulnerabilities. And th that's why I'm pleased to see that both public and private sectors are working together on uh, these issues and that the FCC's uh, uh, CISRAC unanimously endorsed voluntary industry uh, uh, best, uh, you know, industry-wide best practices to address uh, the whole issue of botnets and domain name fraud and internet uh, route hijacking. So uh, I think that they have uh, uh, done very good work, uh, and it's something that we uh, need to um, uh, take advantage of. So today's hearing is really yet another opportunity for us uh, to uh, look at a, uh, uh, this slice that you are. Uh, uh, can teach us about, and that we weave that together uh, all under the umbrella of really uh, safeguarding uh, uh, some of the most important uh, uh, parts of, um, uh, of our national uh, infrastructure 
uh, both public and private, relative to cybersecurity. And with the time that I have remaining, I will yield it to uh, Congresswoman uh, Doris Matsui. Thank you very much, Ranking Member Escher, for yielding me time. And I'd like to welcome our witnesses today. And I want to thank the Chairman very much for um, having this hearing today and having, ex having, having explored some of these issues for the past few, especially the last month or so. Communications networks are one of the many areas our nations must protect and ensure safety and soundness. It will be important that data is protected in transit to cloud storage. A number of government agencies are using cloud services, so it's my hope that we can learn more from their early experiences. I also believe that our subcommittee will have the ability to further promote information sharing on cyber threats. I'll be interested in hearing from witnesses how information is being shared within the government and between the government and industry. There also seems to be a number of clearinghouses that are used to store information related to cyber threats. I'll also be interested in hearing the relationship between those silos and industry and government sharing. Securing the supply chain will be of high importance. We also need to consider that there might be some economic incentives that could encourage industry to explore ways to better address and defend against malware and botnets. And again, I welcome you all here today, and I'm looking forward to the testimony. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thanks for your service on the uh, working group. Uh, let's see, we're going to go now for a, uh, I recognize uh, Representative Bonomac for a minute, and then we still have Mr. Uh, 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 Barton and, and Ms. Blackburn, too. So. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In our two previous hearings on this issue, we've heard from representatives of the private sector and the communications industry who expressed real concern about the effects of heavy-handed new re government regulation in this realm of cybersecurity. Onerous new regulations, they say, will likely fall haplessly behind existing technology and divert valuable resources away from security and towards regulatory compliance. Indeed, with so much information out there about the sophisticated and constantly evolving nature of cyber attacks, what the experts in the field have said they need most is the ability to better share information mm -hmm. about existing cyber threats and the freedom to respond quickly to those threats. Yesterday, Congresswoman, Black, uh, Congress, Congresswoman Blackburn and I introduced the House Companion to Senator John McCain's Secure IT Act, which first removes legal hurdle, hurdles which prevent information sharing across the spectrum so that victims of cyber attacks can better work with each other to respond to cyber threats. I believe that this approach, which empowers security experts to proactively address threats rather than reactively respond to them, is the best path forward. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today. I thank them for appearing before us, and I would like to uh, yield back the balance of my time. And I would recognize the gentlelady from Tennessee for a minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank our witnesses for being here. You've heard us talk about the two previous hearings that we've done with industry, and of course what they've pointed out is that there is no cookie-cutter approach that we can follow as we deal with what are very dangerous issues. Um, one of the things that also has come out is that the federal government needs to be leading by example if we want to provide assurance that there is going to be a pattern of security. Uh, this is going to be important for us uh, to do, to lead by example. Another thing that as we discuss this and how we're going to lead by example, I also want to hear about what you're doing to prioritize your R&D and how we're going to be able to work with the private sector in that, in that vein. As Representative Bonomac mentioned, we introduced the Secure IT Act yesterday. Uh, this is going to focus on strong info sharing components, uh, making certain that we're addressing that, some increased <coughs> penalties for criminals, and priority and coordination of the federal research. So thank you all. Welcome. Yell back. I now recognize uh, Mr. Stearns for a minute. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yesterday, uh, Sean Henry, the FBI's top cyber cop, told the Wall Street Journal that the current public and private approach to fending off hackers is unsustainable, as computer criminals are simply too talented and defensive measures are too weak to stop them. He also expressed that companies need to make major, major changes in the way they use computer networks to avoid further damage to national security. And, Mr. Chairman, I ask that the Wall Street Journal be unanimously consent be part of the record. Uh, without objection. Today's hearing focused on public sector responses to threats to communications networks. I'm interested to hear our witnesses' reaction to Mr. Henry's bleak outlook on our unsustainable model to cybersecurity as he says, quote, 
unsustainable in that you never get ahead, never become secure, never have a reasonable expectation of privacy or security. As chairman of the Oversight uh, Subcommittee Investigation, I've held three cybersecurity hearings. Through these hearings and the ones held by uh, uh, our chairman today, I hope our committee can learn what we can do to make sure the good guys are winning again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman from uh, Florida, and uh, I don't anybody else seeking recognition here. I know Mr. Barton had wanted time, but he's not here. If not, I recognize that uh, yeah, yeah, she's done. So now I'll go to you, Mr. Waxman. I'll we'll return the balance of our time on this side, and I now recognize the uh, chairman emeritus, Mr. Bill Waxman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing on cyber cybersecurity. It's important that we understand the government perspective. I'm especially interested to learn the steps government agencies are taking to advance cybersecurity and secure the supply chain. I also welcome, welcome our expert from Carnegie Mellon. The FCC, under the leadership of Chairman Janikowski and Admiral Barnett, has established a Communications Security, Reliability, and Interoperability Council, or CISRIC. And today we can learn about CISRIC's recent recommendations promoting cybersecurity as well as what other agencies are doing to promote best practices in information sharing. Efforts like CISRIC can help, to lead, help lead to adoption of best practices and voluntary codes of conduct by Internet service providers, software companies, manufacturers, and security vendors. But we also need to address the question of accountability. For example, what if one company fails to be as diligent as others in following best practices and, as a result, causes a cyber breach that rises to the level of a national concern? We need to explore whether reliance solely upon the private sector to ensure the security of communications networks across the country is sufficient and what additional steps we might need to achieve enough accountability to best protect critical communications networks from cyber attacks. We are hearing from industry that they want statutory exemptions from privacy and antitrust laws in order to facilitate information sharing. I have an open mind as we consider these issues, but this should be a two-way street. If industry wants exemptions from consumer protection laws, we have a right to ask for accountability that, a companies, actually end up, that companies actually end up sharing information important for cybersecurity uh, do not abuse their privilege and are held accountable. There is a stronger case to be made for enabling sharing between the federal government and private industry, but we need to balance information sharing with sufficient privacy and civil liberties protections. Further, we need to make sure that the federal agencies that engage in direct information sharing with the private sector are civilian agencies, not intelligence or defense agencies. I hope we will also discuss securing the communications supply chain. This is a growing potential threat, especially as we are now witnessing thousands of applications being loaded onto smart devices that connect to the public Internet. We should examine the best ways to address this. And I want to thank our panel of witnesses for their participa uh, participation today, and I look forward uh, to hearing your testimony. I yield back the time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. We'll now proceed with our witnesses. We thank you all for being here um, and uh, look forward to your comments. We'll start uh, with Ms. Fiona Alexander, Associate Administrator, Office of International Affairs, National Telecommunications and Infrastructure Information Administration, NTIA, U.S. Department of Commerce. That's a mouthful. We're delighted you're here today. We look forward uh, to hearing from you. And just as a, a heads up for everybody, these microphones you have to get pretty close to for people to hear and make sure the, it's lit when you, uh, there you go. Okay. So uh, thank you very much. It is a very long uh, name. Uh, so good morning, Chairman Walden, Ranking Member Eshoo, and members of the committee. Thank you for this opportunity to testify on behalf of the Department of Commerce's NTIA regarding cybersecurity. NTIA, as you know, is the President's Principal Advisor on Telecommunications and Information Policy Matters and is the Executive Branch Expert on issues relating to the Internet's domain name system, a critical component of the cyber infrastructure. NTIA supports a multi-stakeholder approach to the coordination of the DNS to ensure the long-term viability of the Internet. Working with other stakeholders, NTIA develops policies and takes actions to preserve an open, interconnected, global Internet that supports continued innovation and economic growth investment, and the trust of its users. This multi-stakeholder model of Internet policymaking, convening the private sector, civil society, and government, 
to address issues in a timely and flexible manner, has been responsible for the past success of the internet and is critical to its future. The authenticity of DNS data is essential to the security of the internet, as it is vital that users reach their intended destinations and are not unknowingly redirected to fraudulent and malicious websites. This is one of the primary, primary objectives motivating NTI's efforts to secure the DNS and what I will specifically address today. The early DNS, while exceptional in many ways, lacked strong security mechanisms. Over time, hackers and others have found more and more ways to exploit vulnerabilities in the DNS protocol. That put the integrity of DNS data at risk. These vulnerabilities increase the likelihood of certain DNS-related cyber attacks, which can lead to identity theft and other security compromises. In response to these risks, the Internet Engineering Task Force developed a suite of specifications for securing information provided by the DNS called Domain Name System Security Extensions, or DNSSEC. DNSSEC provides an additional layer of security to the DNS by authenticating the origin of DNS data and verifying its integrity while it moves across the Internet. In 2008, NTI undertook a multi-stakeholder public consultation process regarding whether and how DNSSEC should be deployed at the authoritative route, the top level of the DNS hierarchy for which NTIA continues to have historical oversight. In response to the public notice, NTIA received overwhelming support from the international internet community to move forward as soon as possible. Over the next year and a half, NTIA drawing upon the input and expertise of technical experts from around the world and working closely with NIST, our sister agency at Commerce, as well as our root zone management partners, VeriSign and ICANN, moved to fully deploy a DNSSEC at the root in July 2010. DNSSEC essentially gives a tamper-proof seal to the address book of the internet, similar to a wax seal on an envelope. For example, I can send you a letter in an envelope, but when you receive the envelope, you don't know if it was tampered with. But if I use my seal on some wax across the envelope's closure, then you know two things. The letter wasn't tampered with in transit, which means there's data integrity, and that I was the one who sent it because you recognized my stamp, which is data origin authentication. If you know that I always seal my letters and you, a le and you receive a letter from me that isn't sealed or a seal is broken, you know that a bad guy or a man in the middle could have opened the sealed envelope and replaced the contents. You can throw away the letter because you know it's a fake. DNS information is like the letter in the envelope. DNSSEC gives that information a seal that verifies and authenticates it. DNSSEC deployment at the authoritative route was an important step toward protecting the integrity of DNS data and mitigating attacks such as cache poisoning, which allows a hacker to redirect traffic to fraudulent sites and other data modification threats. This effort marks significant progress in making the Internet more robust and secure, as it provides a tool to facilitate greater, greater user confidence in the online experience. So that when someone visits a particular website, whether it be a bank, a retailer, or a doctor, they are not seeing a spoofed copy that cyber criminals can use to perpetuate identity theft or other crimes using the DNS. In helping to deploy DNSSEC at the root zone, NTIA sought to facilitate greater DNSSEC deployment throughout the Internet. If we are to maintain trust in the Internet, then we must support further DNSSEC deployment. Governments, as well as other stakeholders, must continue to support the de deployment and development of DNSSEC-related software, tools, and other products and services. As we explore issues affecting the Internet space, we should take all appropriate steps to ensure that DNSSEC use and adoption continues to grow. In the coming months, NTIA, working as a part of the Department of Commerce's Internet Policy Task Force, will be looking for opportunities to launch further multi-stakeholder processes aimed at enhancing the security and stability of the DNS, as well as broader cybersecurity efforts. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Ms. Alexander, we appreciate your comments, and uh, we look forward to the questions. Uh, Admiral, we're delighted to have you here today. Admiral James Barnett, Jr., retired Chief, Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, Federal Communications Commission, the FCC. Welcome, and we look forward to your comments. Thank you, Chairman Walden and Ranking Member Eshoo and all the distinguished members of the subcommittee. I really appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to you on this important topic of cybersecurity, and I'm particularly pleased to be able to testify with these uh, experts and especially my colleagues from DHS and Commerce with whom we work very closely on cybersecurity matters. Cybersecurity threats are a real and present danger to our current economy and well-being. No one would tolerate the level of criminality, thievery, vandalism or invasion of privacy that we experience today if it were done in the physical world, and we really can no longer uh, afford to tolerate it in cyberspace. The approximately 40,000 autonomous systems or networks on which the Internet is built are largely commercial or privately owned. 
Commercial communication providers are therefore the first line of defense against cyber threats and always will be. Earlier this month, on March 7th, the subcommittee heard from cybersecurity experts in the communications industry about how hard they are working against those threats. Yet, if those efforts alone were sufficient to thwart cyber threats, uh, I don't think we'd be here today. Uh, to be successful in battling cyber threats, we must work together, collectively, industry and the public sector. As the nation's expert agency on communications, we've always been uh, concerned with the security and reliability of, of uh, networks. The FCC has a long history of working on network reliability and security with the companies that operate the core of the Internet. We've con constituted a cybersecurity and communications reliability division in the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau. These are our cyber experts who, among other duties, coordinate the work of our current Federal Advisory Committee, the Communications Security, Reliability and Interoperability Council, CISRC, which you have mentioned before. CISRC is now made up of over 50 industry leaders from the private sector and the Federal Government, including cyber experts from DHS and NIST, and a veritable all-star cast of Internet pioneers and world-class cybersecurity experts uh, they are working on the Council and the working groups. And I am pleased to report that last week CISRC approved voluntary, industry-based recommendations addressing three critical problems. These recommendations are not simply a set of reports that will adorn bookshelves. Uh, numerous ISPs, including Comcast, Verizon, AT&T, Time Warner, Sprint, Cox, T-Mobile, Frontier and CenturyLink have already pledged to implement uh, the CISRC uh, recommendations as they apply to their respective networks. This means that these new cybersecurity measures will soon be protecting a significant majority of American Internet users. First, CISRC recommended that ISPs adopt a voluntary code of conduct to provide critical security to Internet users to fight botnets which can steal personal information. We refer to it as the Antibot Code, a code that specifically addresses privacy of the end user. Second, CISR examined Internet route hijacking, which can occur due to the lack of verification between networks. Internet route hijacking can endanger valuable intellectual and private property and jeopardize our national security. In 2010, traffic to 15 percent of the world's Internet destinations was diverted through Chinese servers for approximately 18 minutes. CISRC recommended that ISPs embark upon a path toward implementation of secure routing protocols, or secure BGP, to minimize route hijacking. This would include the establishment of a secure authoritative database of Internet addresses, address blocks, uh, to be used and checked by ISPs. CISRC's third area of action is the domain name system, DNS, uh, which Ms. Alexander just mentioned. DNS can be thought of as the telephone book for the Internet, one that can be spoofed and can lure the exposure of private information. DNSSEC can correct this problem. It was designed with, the pri with privacy in mind. CISRC endorsed DNSSEC implement implementation by ISPs and industry-wide adoption of the standard to help prevent unsuspecting Internet users from being sent to fraudulent websites. These voluntary initiatives stand as an example to the world of how to promote cybersecurity while preserving the core characteristics of the Internet, which have fueled broadband, the broadband economy's growth and success. These efforts focus on ISPs, but they dovetail into broader cybersecurity efforts by NIST and DHS, which must address the larger information technology community. We will continue to work with industry, the multi-stakeholders and federal partners on voluntary industry-based solutions. We will carefully guard the reliability and security of all communications network. Thank you. Admiral, thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate your testimony, even if it is ever more disturbing <laughs> where we hear. Uh, with that, we'll now go to uh, Mr. Hutchinson, uh, Senior Manager for Information Security Sciences at Sandia National Laboratories. Thanks for all the work you and your team do out there at Sandia, and we appreciate your being here today to further enlighten us about the uh, threat that we face and how we might deal with it appropriately. So please go ahead. Good morning. Chairman Walden and Ranking Member Eshoo and the distinguished members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to testify before you today. I'm Bob Hutchinson, Senior Manager for Information Security Sciences at Sandia National Laboratories. Sandia is a federally funded research and development center for the Department of Energy. DOE makes its significant investment in Sandia cybersecurity capabilities available to the Departments of Defense and Homeland Security, as well as other government agencies and non-federal entities. I've been working to secure government, critical government communication systems, both as a researcher and as an implementer for over 25 years. And today's testimony is based on that experience. 
The most important lesson that I've learned in my career is that computer systems can never be fully trusted and can never be proven free of compromise. So we must focus on finding ways to conduct business, even critical business, on machines that are presumed to be infected. Our focus should be on accomplishing our goals and not on building and maintaining perfect computers and computer networks. I'd like to suggest four specific shifts in current national approach to cybersecurity. Each of these suggestions implies a role for the government and a role for the private sector. My intention is to highlight the strengths of each of these communities and to find ways that they can reinforce each other's interests. Number one, in recent years, the nation's cybersecurity approach has shifted to an almost exclusive focus on data theft. While this trend has been growing for a number of years, it understandably worsened in the aftermath of the WikiLeaks intelligence theft. Our best security analysts are being taught to focus their attention on indications that sensitive data is leaving our networks headed into enemy hands. While data theft is a critical problem for the government and for the private sector, I believe that our nation has diverted too many resources away from an equally, if not more important issue, malicious data modification. As much as I worry about the theft of sensitive data and U.S. intellectual property, my greater fear is that an attacker will alter our data and affect our decision processes. This form of attack has not only economic consequences, but can also impact public safety and confidence. My staff and I focus much of our research on these scenarios. The security community must continue to worry about data theft, but not to the detriment of other cyber attack goals. The government should increase focused research and development investment on preserving data integrity. Number two, we tend to view the stacks of mobile devices and networking components that arrive in U.S. ports as pristine. When we discover a compromise, we strive to return these devices to their original settings. This is a fundamentally flawed security model. We don't have any idea whether our devices have been pre-compromised during design, manufacture, or distribution. We call this a supply chain attack. As an unclassified example, a few years ago, a major hard drive manufacturer was discovered to have shipped brand new hard drives with malware pre-installed. The government, in part through Sandia, has been addressing these supply chain attacks for over three decades. But commercial companies share this risk with the government. The government can help industry by informing commercial companies of our lessons learned and helping those companies use their existing supplier relationships to begin addressing this problem where it will have the greatest impact, directly within the company's own supply chains. Number three, it's not enough that the government shares details of cybersecurity incidents with the community of interest. It also needs to develop and share strategies. Cybersecurity is more like a game of poker than a reaction to a natural disaster. Simply sharing data without rules and strategies prevents us from working together effectively. For instance, careful coordination of our activities can cause an adversary to reveal his identity. Finally, number four, the most consistent cybersecurity message across government and industry is that our nation has a profound shortage of qualified cybersecurity experts. There are many efforts to educate, train, and certify. Degrees and certifications are not enough. Cybersecurity is a new field that lacks scientific and engineering rigor. The best people in this field learn through practice and apprenticeship. They use judgment that is based on years of experience. The Department of Energy began to address this, is this issue over 10 years ago when they asked Sandia to build a program that's more like a medical residency than a trade certification. Many of the people who have participated in this program have become national leaders in securing emerging technologies such as mobile device networks and cloud services. This investment has yielded greater returns than any other program in which I've been involved. Expanding this model so that all U.S. cybersecurity professionals learn through a residency would result in enormous gains for national security. I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to testify, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Hutchinson. We appreciate your, uh, your disturbing testimony. Uh, uh, now we're going to go to Mr. Greg Shannon, the Chief Scientist, Community, uh, Computer Emergency Readiness Team, Software Engineering Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, Dr. Shannon, thank you for being here. We look forward to your testimony. Thank you, Chairman Walden, Ranking Member Eshoo, and distinguished committee members. I'm honored to testify before you today on cybersecurity and communication networks. I'm the Chief Scientist for the CERT Cybersecurity Program at the Software Engineering Institute, which is a Department of Defense, FFRDC, operated by Carnegie Mellon University. CERT was created in 1988 by DARPA in response to the Morris Worm incident. 
And now we are a national asset for cybersecurity with 250 staff tackling our nation's technical cybersecurity uh -huh. challenges. At CERT, we recognize the long-term challenges as we confront the threats, deliver pragmatic solutions, and consider the technical roles of the private and public sectors. We see two important policy opportunities with long-term benefits. First is to broadly promote the use of scientifically and operationally validated policies, best practices, technologies, standards, products, etc. Validated capabilities should trump unvalidated ones. Second is to actively enable controlled access to real, to real high fidelity operational data for research. Good results require good data as part of a long-term solution. Rigor and data are the foundations of many successful technical public-private partnerships such as National Centers for Disease Control, the National Highway Transportation Traffic Safety Administration, and the National Transportation Safety Board. Trusted public-private collaborations represent our mature adoption of technology and are an important step for cybersecurity to become a distinguishing capability for our nation. Understanding today's cyber threats to our communications networks is about more than war stories, anecdotes, and scare tactics. Adversaries can combine supply chain and operational vulnerabilities in hardware, software, data, and humans to create multitudes of attack strategies. Policy should address the root causes of our cyber threats and not just the immediate symptoms. Otherwise, our adversaries will merely use another combination of what we haven't yet explicitly blocked, which is a continuously losing battle for cybersecurity. For decades, the public sector, often in partnership with CERT, has addressed the technical symptoms and root causes of cybersecurity threats and attacks together. At CERT, we help millions of programmers write secure software to address the root cause of vulnerable software. We help agencies protect critical information, critical infrastructure operated by hundreds of private companies to address the challenges of responding to active attacks with potentially serious consequences. Using our decade-long work on resiliency management and smart grid maturity models, we are helping the Department of Energy, DHS, and the White House with the Electricity Sector Cybersecurity Risk Management Maturity Project. Such work will remove core vulnerabilities and decrease the impact of attacks. To better understand cybersecurity problems and solutions, the science of cybersecurity is now broadly endorsed and funded by key federal science and technology agencies, including the Department of Energy. Policymakers can assist the research community by explicitly requesting cybersecurity innovations and practices that are scientifically and operationally valid. Furthermore, policymakers can request data owners, public or private, and the research organizations who can diligently use the data to pr provide appropriate access to high fidelity operational data. Only with such data can cybersecurity researchers learn leading attack indicators, identify underlying principles, and evaluate solutions. Another role for the public sector is to improve the trust required for effective cyber attack preparation and response by clarifying public and private roles in cybersecurity, especially with respect to information sharing. Consider establishing one or more national repositories of operational cybersecurity data for research purposes. Access to such a repository would enable cyber research to reach new levels. Sharing cyber data with strong privacy controls would engender research that can look more globally and more predictably at the problem, especially in the long term. In conclusion, every day we at CERT see the value of trust, rigor, and data in helping mitigate cyber vulnerabilities, threats, and attacks. We look forward to the day when our nation can handle cybersecurity threats and attacks with the same efficiency and effectiveness as our nation's response to the H1N1 health crisis. Then cybersecurity will truly be a distinguishing national capability alongside others such as our ability to innovate. Thank you. Doctor, thank you. We appreciate your testimony. And our final witness on the panel, Ms. Roberta Stempley, Acting Assistant Secretary for Cybersecurity and Communications, Department of Homeland Security. We're delighted to have you here this morning, and we look forward to your testimony. Thank you very much, Chairman Waldron and Ranking Member Eshoo. Um, as you said, I'm with the Department of Homeland Security. I have two decades of experience as a public servant working both in the Defense Department for 18 years and now almost two years um, at the Department of Homeland Security. And it's certainly a privilege for me to have the opportunity to come and speak to you today about the efforts that the Department of Homeland Security has that support the cybersecurity of our important communications networks. Um, as you know, uh, the private sector owns most of the national infrastructure in the communications industry. 
environment. And as such, protecting the communications networks is not something the federal government can or should do alone. Um, there is no silver bur bullet to cybersecurity, as my uh, esteemed panel colleagues have indicated. There's not a single tool, a single technique, nor a single organization who is responsible for, or who is capable or accountable or uh, responsible for delivering cybersecurity to the uh, communications networks. But access to reliable and consistent communications is essential to ma maintaining the nation's health, safety, economy, and public, public confidence. Protection of communications infrastructure from this range of threats, national disasters, terrorism, and cybersecurity is of the highest priorities to the Department of Homeland Security. And this communications infrastructure is complex. It is a system of systems with multiple ownerships and multiple interconnection points. Um, it involves wireline, wireless, satellite, broadcast, um, and uh, capabilities, and serve the transport and enable this internet that we live, play, and function on. Um, the Office of Cybersecurity and Communications in the Department's National Protection and Programs Directorate is designated the federal entity uh, to lead the coordination with both the communications and information technology sectors of critical infrastructure. We work closely with these partners and ensure robust and resilient communications throughout the nation. Within this Office of Cybersecurity and Communications, we have an organization called the National Communication System, which is the lead for the communication sector. It leads government industry coordination, critical in the planning, initiation, restoration, and reconstitution of national security, emergency preparedness, service, and facilities. The National Cybersecurity Division is responsible for leadership in the information technology sector and responsible for major cybersecurity programs that we'll be speaking of today. Additionally, we have the Office of Emergency Communication, which supports and promotes the ability of emergency responders and government officials to communicate in the event of a disaster. The Office of Emergency Communication's focus is on that interoperable and operable emergency communications nationwide. All of these organizations and others come together in an operations center called the National Cybersecurity Communication and Integration Center. It houses the National Co Coordinating Center for Communications, a part of the National Communication System, the U.S. Computer Emergency Readiness Team, um, a part of the National Cybersecurity Division, as well as other partners from industry um, and across the federal government, including members of the Communications Information Sharing and Analysis Center. Our collective efforts tie into the DHS-wide collaboration and extend our partnership with federal, federal, state, local governments, and the private sector. And together we work um, under orchestration to mitigate threats to the communications infrastructure and to build strategies for future success. Protection of that communications infrastructure is conducted in this holistic fashion and encompasses physical and cyber threat strategies. Partnerships are key and very important, as is two-way information sharing. We have this information sharing real-time on the floor, as I indicated, where 5,200 alerts were released by U.S. CERT to our partners over the course of the last year. Uh, the department employs mechanisms to ensure that the sensitive proprietary information shared with us from industry is protected and that privacy and civil liberties are upheld. It is industry's willingness to share this information on a voluntary basis that speaks to the strong trust between DHS and its private sector partners as we work forward in this situation. I spoke to that communications information sharing and analysis center. Their information sharing and analysis centers within each sector. They are sector specific. And in that comm sector, we have 56 private sector partners that were the first operations entity um, from the private sector on the floor of the National Cybersecurity Communications Integration Center. In addition, in the department, the secretary um, serves as the executive agent supporting the president's National Security Technology Advisory Committee. This committee is comprised of up to 30 chief executives from industries like network service providers, telecommunications, information technology, finance, and aerospace companies. The NSTAC makes recommendations to the president on strategies and practices to secure vital communications links through events and crises. We also have work in partnership on communication sector supply chain threats, an item of interest to the committee today. Given the increasing use of technology such as smartphones by first responders, um, there are real innovations available in that situation. And the public safety broadband network that this committee was so integral in establishing must be secure and reliable so that emergency responders can be assured that sensitive information is protected and accurate. DHS is committed to working with all of our public and private sector partners today, including NTIA and the FCC, who I'm pleased to be with on committee or on the panel today, to ensure we secure the national public safety broadband network through this holistic approach with equal emphasis on protecting confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify, and I am pleased to answer your questions.
Thank you, uh, Ms. Stempley. We appreciate your comments. We were just talking here about, as you described, the center out here, uh, about maybe the subcommittee coming out to take a look at some point. We so. welcome you. Um, uh, anytime you'd like, we would be more than honored to have you out there um, we, uh, and show you the span of activity that goes on in that center. As I said in, um, in my comments, it is a, uh, a place where government and industry come together. We have representatives not just from the communication sector, but from the information technology sector, from the financial sector, and from other partners on that floor, as well as partners across government from uh, the intelligence community and others. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, the, uh, my first question uh, would be to you. The Department of Commerce's Economic Development Administration recently suffered a cyber attack that's left the agency without network connectivity for several weeks, I'm told. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate on that situation and what DHS has been doing to address it and has it been resolved? The Department of Homeland Security's responsibility for uh, protection and defense of the federal executive civilian branch, including the Department of Commerce, um, includes responsibilities for supporting a department when they've re um, had a compromise of the, the nature that you're mm -hmm. describing at the EDA. We have individuals on the ground with Commerce uh, to support EDA in the reconstitution of their network and in building it in a way that uh, is supportive of increased security and the meeting of the federal standards um, that are initiated both by the Department and of the Federal Information Security Management Act. So are they still offline? Um, I'm personally not sure, sir, at the moment, but would happy to follow up with you yeah. on that one, on, on both. Any ones. idea where the attack came from? Um, I, uh, I don't worries. know attribution um, in this situation. Attribution is generally the responsibility of law enforcement and the uh. intelligence community. Um, we, we are responsible for protection and mitigation measures, and I'm happy to come back with our partners It'd from Commerce and to speak know. to you. Yeah, that seems pretty major if it's been offline for several weeks. So, um, there, There's been a resounding call for increased consumer education when it comes to cybersecurity, and this is kind of for everybody here. However, a report released earlier this month by TrustWave showed that after studying more than 300 data breaches in 2011, five, nearly 5% 5 of the passwords on the compromised networks were variations of the word password. So if end users cannot even wrap our heads around not using the word password as a password, how can we as policymakers promote better understanding of a complex topic like route hijacking? Anybody want to take that one quickly? Yeah, at Carnegie Mellon University, there's a large number of uh, researchers studying how to make security and privacy usable, and it is turning, turning out to be very daunting. The password uh, research uh, uh, has shown that uh, uh, people do reuse passwords. When you get populations of passwords together, uh, it creates a vulnerability. So it becomes clear that individuals, it's, it's difficult for us to rely on individuals to right. be the foundation of security. I, I want to ask a different question of you, uh, Dr. Shannon. Some of the vulnerabilities in compromised systems persist despite common knowledge among computer programmers of the problem. For example, uh, SQL, the structured query language, <coughs> injection has been one of the most common vectors for database attacks for years, I'm told. How do we change the culture of coding to ensure that security is more of a focus? One is to by, by providing explicit guidelines, which we've been doing for the last 10 years. Uh, SQL is not the la a language that we have tackled. We've been focusing on C++ and Java um, and the C programming language. Um, part of the challenge is, is that we do not control where the programs are written, so they may be written offshore under economically stressed and, and time uh, constraints. Uh, so it's a, a challenge of improving the general practice, and by providing coding standards is, is our step in that direction. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Hutchinson, you, you recommended, I think, four points of, of things we should, we should look at um, and talked about the uh, device supply chain issues and this notion of uh, pre-compromises of, of hardware with malware installed. Are there more examples of that we should be aware of in this setting? Um, in, in this setting, um, I, I can't cover uh, the examples I'm aware of are classified, but um, okay. you know, I, would, uh, I, I would very much welcome a classified discussion on that topic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Could you speak more about the malicious data modification issues in this setting? What does that mean? What, uh, what, what are we seeing as the example? So when, let's see, let me, just for context, when, when, you, when an event occurs on a network, the most normal thing for an analyst to do is to look for the exfiltration of data from that network, okay. to analyze malicious code to determine whether it's stealing data from the network and, and, and pointing it in the direction of the adversary. The malicious modification 
would be something that the, that the compromise leaves behind that alters the data, changes the nature of the data, changes emails, I see. things like that. Okay. And, and a question I've asked all the panels we've had before, sort of in line with the Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm. Do you each, could you real quickly just say, what's the uh, one caution you could offer us as we promulgate legislation? Ms. Alexander, what shouldn't we do? Um, I think it's important that as people consider uh, ways to deal with this important issue, there's a grounding and understanding of how the network actually works so that rules that are developed don't inadvertently undercut some of the other activities. All right, Admiral Barnett. So I, th I think it's important to make sure that we don't cut off this engine of in innovation that as we move forward that, that we continue to have that, that openness and, and uh, the place with broadband. But I would also say that as you do it, you have to look at what, what the performance metrics are. the things that we're doing actually having some effect? We have to have data driven to make sure that we're actually doing some good. Mr. Hutchinson. So there, there are some very strong relationships in helping this problem, like the relationship between DHS and NSA. Anything that would harm that relationship, I think, would be, would be hurtful to, to the government. The NSA so keeping open communication. Could, yes, that, that communication and the relationship between NSA and applying classified approaches to this otherwise unclassified problem, I think, is extraordinarily valuable. Okay. Dr. Shannon? Um, I think you need to protect the innovation, as the Admiral mentioned. Uh, there's a balance between uh, too little security that uh, allows for the loss of intellectual property and then onerous security that imposes a tax on innovation in the long term and makes us no better than other, uh, uh, other countries that are, are um, you know, more restrictive in how their citizens behave. So I think there's a real balance to maintain there uh, to promote uh, innovation. All right. Ms. Stempfley? Um, as several individuals have identified, there are relationships and partnerships and multiple organizations that are involved, and those relationships must equally be sustained, and we must continue to empower the multiple organizations that are involved right. here. Thank you all very much. Now I'll turn to uh, Ms. Eshoo for questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, to each of the witnesses, thank you. Um, excellent uh, testimony. Um, there were a group of students that were here, and I, you're facing this way, but I, I couldn't help but notice that they all left en masse, and I thought we've either scared the hell out of them or bored them. I don't know. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, it, um, I, I think that uh, that might apply to us as well uh, because there are so many moving parts to this. Um, I have a whole list of very specific questions, but I, 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 I want to set those aside. Uh, I'll put them in writing to you, and uh, I don't think we need to ask for unanimous consent. That no, because we can uh, do you that. Now have uh, it. Uh, uh, members ask uh, questions in uh, writing of the uh, of the witnesses. Um, when you look, when we look at this, the whole issue of cybersecurity, it's my understanding that it's a five percent responsibility is the, in the public sector, in the government. Ninety-five percent of this rests with the, uh, with the private sector. Um, uh, now, uh, CISRIC has come up with uh, uh, some recommendations, both the chairman and myself, and I think that other members have referenced it, maybe some of you did in your testimony. But I, I want to ask you the following question, um, and I appreciate the rather deep dives that you've done on your specific area of expertise and what your uh, observations are. But for each one of you, on the 5 percent, on the 5 percent, which is the government, um, what is the top recommendation that you would make to us that, needs, that we need to take into consideration that will um, help, um, what, uh, 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 remake the landscape into a very smart one uh, to address um, uh, the threats that come to us relative to uh, cybersecurity in the government? Ms. Alexander? I, I don't have a lot of time. We've got like three minutes for, what, two, four, five of you, so. Sure, I'll be very quick. <laughs> I think um, in addition to this idea of continuing innovation and voluntary codes of conduct, government's very powerful as a user, mm -hmm. and so if government systems, and we can set examples, and we can influence uh, procurement patterns, I think that's one of the most powerful things that we can do as government. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Admiral, thank you for your wonderful work. Thank, thank you, ma'am. So I, I think uh, continuing to seek uh, voluntary and 
industry based solutions is, is the bedrock incentivizing that and looking for that and then obviously as almost every person mentioned to us in your openings we really have to tackle supply chain mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you so maintaining opt-in alternatives for industry to seek government's help and in incentivizing those i think is critical and the supply chain is an area that will will become increasingly uh problematic mm -hmm. and I, I think we need to work hard with industry to take the government no, no how. Mm -hmm. um, I would say trust is. Excuse uh, me, uh, just uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Shannon. Let me get back to you, Mr. Hutchinson. Are you suggesting that the uh, uh, that uh, the practices from within the uh, on the public side is something that the private side I can gain a great deal from? And yes, not the this other is way the around? problem that that the uh, that the private side does not understand well, and the government understands very well. Yet the private side has the problem to the same degree that the government does. Mm -hmm. So this is a great opportunity for the government to inform. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Shannon? Um, since the public is the hands that uh, carries, you know, as you mentioned, carries out uh, most of the activity, it's the, the public sector's par opportunity is to promote trust. And that's really one of the distinguishing capabilities of our society. And as mm -hmm. Jim Lewis has talked in other uh, venues, it's something that c distinguishes us from how our other, other uh, our adversaries may approach things. So promoting trust, I think, is the, the real opportunity on the government side. I see. Thank you very much. Uh, continue refinement in statute of the authorities of the government in a continue situation. What? I said continue refinement in statute of authorities of organizations such as the Department of Homeland Security. What which does in, that mean? Um, Excuse me. What does it mean? Uh, so what that means, ma'am, is uh, what you find in the department is that our authorities are spread across multiple statutes and multiple directives, and uh, it is a, a bit of a, a patchwork landscape uh, for us and provides great... Uh, um, well, that's the story of DHS. <laughs> Uh, yes, ma'am, and, and so, shot. so we find that uh, um, if we refine Gatter that in agency. a, and we refine that relative to statute, that will put some clarity um, in terms of this and enable stronger information sharing mm -hmm. and information sharing in action. Let me ask you something about this. Uh, uh, it sounds to me like a mini NSA with uh, the, uh, the what you have this uh, center. Uh, is it? Do you deal with things after the fact, and then you can advise uh, federal agencies about how? Uh, uh, a, a cyber threat has um, affected them, or do you defend uh, the uh, uh, the uh, the workings of uh, of agencies so that they don't experience it? I'm not so sure what this group does, but I, we'd like to come out and see it. But uh, uh, can you answer that for us? I'm trying to picture it and what you do. So I certainly can, ma'am. Um, we do. We provide uh, prevention information and standards for federal branch, federal executive, civilian branches to follow that are about raising the security of their branch. So, so items they must do um, in order to be uh, in order to meet the standard. And then we provide response actions when something goes wrong, um, as well as detection and prevention activities um, at the boundary. Well, I'm over my time, and I thank all of you for your. Uh, not only the work you do, but uh, making that come alive here is uh, uh, in your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now turn to Mr. Terry, the Vice Chair of the Subcommittee, for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, to follow up on both of the sets of questions, uh, Admiral Barnett, I want to uh, commend you, uh, Admiral Job on uh, CISRIC. And uh, could you just briefly go over what the, the the main principles, the five main principles that are outlined by CISRIC? So, so the, and I might say there are three major things that they're right. came forward. I'm very pleased to have with me Jeff Goldthorpe, who is our Associate Bureau Chief for, for Cybersecurity, who, who really led and put together this incredible team. So the first one was the Antibot uh, Code of Conduct for ISPs. All these address ISPs. They're all voluntary, industry-based. Um, and, and basically the five tenets under the anti-bot thing is education of the public so they understand what uh, the problems are, and that obviously goes to prevention, detection when they are infected, providing notice to them that their computer is infected because most of the time they don't realize that their computer is infected, and then giving them some tools or some resources in order to get their computer clean, and then collaboration to make sure that that information is spread across other ISPs so that we're fighting all this together. Then with regard to DNSSEC, it is an encouragement to, to move forward on implementation, so to make all DNSSEC servers DNSSEC aware. And on the Internet uh, route hijacking, which, uh, as uh, the chairman mentioned, is, is a little bit arcane and hard to understand, but the, the main thing is, is to establish a secure, authoritative database 
in which addresses can be registered. So this would probably be with the American Registry of Internet Numbers. And then ISPs can actually check their routes against it, and it will be authoritative. They'll know where it's going. This will be, this, we think this will get rid of all of the misrouting and will do a lot to uh, help us detect malicious routing. So those will be the three main things. All right. You, know, you mentioned a key phrase in there, voluntary and industry-based. Uh, can you tell us uh, why it's important that uh, there are standards and ways of implementing what you stated should be voluntary and industry-based? Uh, the FCC, uh, as a regulator, actually has a long history of working with industry to come up with best practices. As a matter of fact, the FCC's INRIC, a pre pre predecessor of uh, CISRIC, came up with the first um, cybersecurity best practices back in 2002. Uh, so by getting the experts together in the same room and coming up with, with best practices, with codes like this, we think we can get a, a lot of things done. And it's also important, and CISRIC's work continues, to make sure that we have the metrics to understand are those voluntary measures actually having the effect that we want to, so that CISRIC's work actually continues. All right. Uh, starting with you, Ms. Alexander, do you agree with those principles? I think, yes, at NTA, we would very much support sort of a multi-stakeholder approach to Internet policymaking, and it's really important that the breadth of stakeholders that are involved in the ecosystem be part of these processes. How about uh, voluntary and industry stand uh, and industry uh, yes, does sir. their own standards? Yes, sir. Mr. Hutchinson, what do so you I, think? I agree with the voluntary nature of the standards. Uh, one thing that we need, though, is better experimentation around what constitutes best practices rather than just a declaration. We need to be able to conduct experiments. Good point. Mr. Shannon, you're the one non-federal government employee at this panel. Yes. Um, I actually participated in the uh, 2002 uh, ENRIC uh, uh, discussions, uh, so I understand the value of that collaboration. As uh, the Admiral mentioned, I agree that uh, putting metrics in place to determine if they're being effective is appropriate. You know, take the lightest weight approach first. If voluntary compliance works, then that is excellent, and it would be wonderful to have metrics that confirm that. Very good. And Ms. Stemfly. Uh, thank you, sir. Right. Um, I believe that uh, the innovations that industry provides and the best practices they provide are incredibly useful and very vital in our um, success in this environment, and bringing them together in a voluntary nature is uh, very important um, as we go forward. With the metrics associated with both their effectiveness and their use, um, I think is, uh, um, is the place where we need to make There's sure. There's some effort by some uh, senators and members uh, that state that Homeland Security should be the one developing with industry. Uh, the standards uh, for cybersecurity in the private sector. Do you agree with that? I believe that Homeland Security's responsibilities are building standards across critical infrastructure and working with the sector experts in each sector for standards for cybersecurity. How would you develop those standards? We would develop and how them. How would you enforce them? By uh, rule? What I'm, happens? I'm sorry, sorry, I didn't hear you. Would that inc uh, include developing rules then? Um, I believe that uh, we need to bring industry together in order to uh, de determine within each sector what's important and then um, identify where we need to uh, put in place best practice and, and um, rules or other mechanisms for assurance of compliance with best practices. All right. I would uh, respectfully state that I disagree, and I think, uh, frankly, uh, putting an agency in charge of developing rules, even with collaboration, uh, is dooming that industry. Yield back. Gentleman yields back his time. Now recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Matsui. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. An integral part of how the government is asking agencies to reform their IT purchasing involves greater use of the cloud. As the government's chief information officer has said, last year agencies successfully migrated 40 services to the cloud and were able to eliminate more than 50 legacy systems in order to save taxpayer dollars while expanding capabilities. I have a question for Admiral Barnett, uh, Ms. Alexander, and uh, Ms. Stempley. Some of the government agencies here today are using cloud services. What can you share with us from your early experiences with regard to cyber protections and threats? Ms. Alexander? I'm actually not the department's expert on uh, cloud issues, but I'd be happy to make sure we get you an answer for the record. Admiral Barnett? Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so cloud services, uh, my, my former co colleague at FCC, um, 
uh, Steve Van Roekel, uh, has, has highlighted how valuable cloud services can be. It does emphasize the need to make sure that the transport between uh, the user agency or company and, and that, that cloud is secure and reliable. It's another thing that we and I think uh, the, the people that you'll see at this table are considering is what happens for continuity of operations, continuity of government. And so there's some considerations that we need to make sure on that, but really it emphasizes some of the very same things that we've talked about today is, is the network reliability and security. Okay. Ms. Densley? Um, cloud presents some really good opportunities to get your arms around configuration management and architecting opportunities to, to get at the root cause. It also has some uh, particular threat opportunities as well as Admiral Brown indicated. And you have to look at it in that holistic lens as we move forward. And it's certainly a part of the government's program to do so. Okay, but as the private sector moves increasingly to the cloud, what challenges do you foresee? Um, so I think as, a, um, as Admiral Brown indicated, the, uh, bringing all of the content together into a single place uh, presents a, a route diversity requirement and a continuity requirement. Cloud also presents the opportunity to overcome that um, within the way the cloud is architected. So it's a, it is a, a wonderful capability for us, but it, it is one of those where it's both a challenge and opportunity simultaneously. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Shannon, it's my understanding that there are a number there are, area, there are a number of clearinghouses, area clearinghouses, that are used to store information uh, relating to cyber threats. U.S. CERT acts as one of these clearinghouses. What is the relationship between those silos and industry and government sharing? Can any company access your clearinghouse, or do they need to be a member of some sort? Uh, CERT is part of a uh, FFRDC uh, collaboration, and along with NIST, to create vulnerability databases, and that is a public resource that's widely available. Of course, we also participate in uh, government-focused uh, ones, and that's part of the uh, policy decisions that need to be made that are part of the discussions about how to share that more broadly. Okay, so with multiple clearinghouses, does it make sense to have a streamlined process for information sharing for any stakeholder who is threatened with attack or at risk? Any, anyone who is under threat or under attack needs to know where to turn to. And I think providing that clarity is part of what policymakers can uh, help resolve. Uh, there's been times when CERT has served that uh, purpose, U.S. CERT has served that purpose, um, and as Ms. Stempley uh, indicated, there is, uh, uh, there is confusion. Okay. Um, uh, Admiral Barnett, I'm pleased to hear you already have commi commitments from major ISPs to implement CISRIC uh, recommendations. How do we ensure that smaller companies with likely much fewer resources have the ability and incentives to do the same? Uh, it's a great question, ma'am. One of the things I think you'll see is that these things are going to start becoming the industry standard. We've given a lot of flexibility for, for companies to and how they implement them and over what time. Hopefully they can do them along with their just normal pro business processes. Working with the um, American Cable Association on maybe the smaller systems to figure out what are the best ways. And one of the major things is, that, as I mentioned, Scissoric work continues. The next things that we set them on is, what are the barriers to implementation? How do we get over those? So these same great experts are going to come back together and start working on those very things. So there's a concerted effort to reach out to some of the smaller yes, ones. Yes, ma'am. Okay, yeah. that's great. Good. Um, let me see. Dr. Shannon, um, in your testimony, you stress the importance of secure coding. So secure code initiatives such as addressing root causes of cyber threats. Is this concept applicable to apps that are downloaded to mobile, mobile devices that connect to the internet, such as smartphones and our tablets? Yes, it's, it's highly applicable. I mean, there's two parts of the app's uh, development environment. One is the infrastructure, uh, and that needs to be coded securely. Uh, fortunately for the app developers, it's a more constrained environment, so there's uh, it's, uh, a possibility for the, uh, uh, the ecosystem owner to pr help protect uh, the users and to ensure that uh, the app developers are uh, developing appropriate apps. But part of it is is that there, you know, we will find uh, vulnerabilities there, and then it's how do you train, you know, the teenagers that are writing the <laughs> apps uh, right. to write them correctly. I mean, it is, it's a serious challenge. But you know, it's, it's that balance with innovation. Sure. Okay. Thank you very much. You hire them at Sandia Labs, <laughs> right? <laughs> Uh, we'll go now to a uh, gentlelady from California, Ms. Mona Mack, for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Stempley, I can't see you over there, but uh, my first question is directed to you. 
Since Congress created the Chemical Facility Anti-Terrorism Standards, or what we call CFATS, program in 2007, there have been ongoing programs, uh, problems with the way DHS has managed the program. These problems include DHS improperly tiering 600 chemical facilities, wasteful spending, and the inability of DHS to properly train the workforce responsible for carrying out the chemical security program. Hundreds of millions have been spent on CFATs. We find ourselves with a program that has been mismanaged, wasted taxpayer dollars, and no assurance that our chemical facilities are, in fact, secure. Uh, can you tell me, uh, with these significant problems in the, in the instance of CFATs, how you could possibly ensure to this committee that DHS will not manage cybersecurity? Thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to address that. Um, the, the differences between chemical facilities and information technology and communication are um, fairly profound um, in that situation. And, uh, and so as we work as a department of experts um, brought together and engage in these discussions with industry about what are the basic standards that are necessary, we en envision um, building those basic standards in that scenario. Um, and then le learning lessons across the department from um, areas where we have uh, um, we have worked through issues, uh, we want to ensure that we don't make the same mistakes a second time. Oh, with all due respect, I didn't really hear an answer um, in your answer, but I would uh, say to you that uh, if perhaps there are differences between chemical facilities and cybersecurity, yet I think from the American people's point of view, it's the bureaucracies, and I think you've rattled off quite a list of acronyms. Uh, but I don't know that my constituents would feel safer by the list of acronyms that you have used. In fact, to me, did I mishear you, but the example of the EDA's website or network being down for weeks when you were asked the question by the chairman, uh, what, is your, you know, what do you do and that you are responsible for prevention and mitigation, is that not an example, though, of a failure of all of these bureaucracies to, in fact, work together well? Um, the example presented by the chairman, ma'am, um, uh, um, with Commerce is an example where we in the department and the Department of Commerce have uh, joint action that must be taken. Um, so in that scenario, the, uh, the Department of Commerce has the responsibility for the management and, um, def uh, management and security of their systems in, in building them and in operating them following the standards set by the Department of Homeland Security. Thank you. Uh, to Admiral uh, Barnett, uh, you know, I, I agree that the federal government should be involved in our country's cybersecurity efforts, absolutely, but that they should be enhancing cooperation and they should be the facilitator, not a regulator. Can you elaborate a little bit uh, with, on your thoughts on the value of a cooperative relationship with a private sector versus a regulatory one? Yes, ma'am. So certainly the, the CISRIC actions last week are an example of that, but we, there are many, many others. Uh, CISRIC also addresses uh, cooperation in the telecommunications industry on next generation 911, on our emergency alerting, and uh, as Dr. Shannon mentioned, we've, got, we've done this for years and years. It, it, I think it's helpful uh, when you have the regulator who's the expert uh, in, in the, uh, in the uh, United States uh, to be involved with this, to be able to sit down with industry. Uh, just like the experts that I mentioned that I brought with me today, we have experts in other areas like the ones I've mentioned in uh, Next Generation 911. To be able to sit down with the industry to pull them together, and quite frankly, uh, that's one of the reasons that we were able to pull together these experts to come up with voluntary and industry-based solutions. Thank you. I, I think my biggest concern is recognizing how quickly uh, the cyber world moves and, and the bad guys are by nature one step ahead of the good guys. So the question really is, with all of the regulatory hurdles potentially, uh, how do we in really keep pace with the threat? Uh, yes, ma'am. So recognizing that the large majority in, uh, of telecommunications and cybersecurity are in private hands, uh, there, there's a couple of things to that. They are the first line of defense. Our actions, and I think what you've heard mostly uh, from these panelists is, is to enhance those. But we also have to uh, uh, recognize something else. It's not working. We wouldn't be here concerned about this if, it was, uh, uh, if that was enough. And so, as Dr. Shannon mentioned, we have to have metrics to make sure that the, the voluntary methods that we're employing work. Uh, and then beyond that, to, to look at whatever else. Hopefully, uh, there would be other things that we could do. So information sharing is one thing. Uh, there may be other best practices that we can, that can do. But the thing that's an absolutely uh, prerequisite on this is 
we have to make sure that they're effective because we cannot go on any longer the way we are now. Thank you. Which is my last question, then I'm out of time, but uh, to any of you, are, um, are government agencies able to effectively combat cyber agitators that we're very well aware of right now, like Anonymous and LulzSec, and what, uh, what are we doing to stop their attacks? To anybody, I'll pose that question, and then I'm out of time. So government departments and agencies every day are um, working to defend against t threats, as you indicated, both in terms of anonymous and LulzSec. Um, and in, uh, in the instance where they have been unsuccessful, um, we work in partnership to help them overcome the um, impacts of those uh, attacks in that situation um, through a layered defense strategy, which includes things like the Einstein program and things like the establishment of standards through the federal network security programs. I would say just briefly, I would encourage you to talk to the law enforcement community. I think they've been doing a very effective job uh, given some of the recent arrests in that area. All right. Well, I'm, y thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the time, and I yield back. General Lee yields back, and Admiral Barnett, we, we agree with you on the accountability and matrix and all that. In fact, we have a bill we just passed across the House floor yesterday related to your agency on the same matters. Uh, Ms. Matsui for five minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. Wait a minute. Uh, Mr. Dingell for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I hope you're not s still smarting from yesterday's handling of that legislation. Uh, good morning. This first question will be to all witnesses, yes or no. Ladies and gentlemen, industry witnesses told the subcommittee on March 7, 2012, that the federal government would facilitate better inter-industry and public-private information sharing. Do you agree with that opinion, yes or no, starting with Ms. Alexander? Yes. Admiral? Yes, information sharing can, can be just, a government just, uh, just yes, role. Just yes or no, because we have yes. limited time. Yes. Ma'am? Yes. Good. Again, to all witnesses, uh, again, uh, yes or no. Senator Lieberman's cybersecurity bill, S-20105, requires the Secretary of Homeland Security to promulgate risk-based cybersecurity performance requirements for owners of critical infrastructure. Do you believe the promulgation of such requirements is wise, yes or no? Yes. Admiral? Yeah. Uh, they don't have a nod button. You've got to say yes. Uh, yes. Sorry. Or no. Uh, next witness. Yes. Next no witness. comment. Next. Yes. Thank you. Now, this is to all witnesses. Similarly, do you believe promulgation of such performance requirements would stifle innovation and harm industry's ability to protect Consumers from cyber threats, yes or no? Ms. No. Alexander. No. Admiral? No. Next witness? Yes. Next witness? It, it's a risk. Uh, yeah, next witness? No. All right. Now, Admiral Barnett, you mentioned in your testimony the Communication Security Reliability Interoperability Council, that's CISRIC, recommendations about preventing domain name spoofing, root hijacking, and botnet attacks. These recommendations are vol voluntary, are they not? Yes, sir. Now again, Admiral, how many internet service providers, ISPs, have adopted CSRIC's recommendation? There have been nine internet service providers that have, have pledged to implement those recommendations. Out of how many? Uh, <laughs> well, there are literally thousands, I guess, when you tar start count, uh, talking about the cable, uh, small cable operators, and we're working with uh, the various so associations. So what you're to telling me is you have a penetration of nine out of thousands. Well, we've got a, a, a penetration that will cover 80 percent of American Internet users right from the beginning, and we will continue to go toward 100 percent. Of course, if you've got, they can shut down your banking industry, they can shut down your electrical utility industry, your handling of your net they could uh, shut down the natural gas pipeline system in this country, refineries, auto companies, God knows what else they could shut down with that kind of opportunity available. Uh, that's, that's why we're going to continue to work for 100 percent. When will you hit 100 percent? Do you have any idea? Uh, no, we don't at this particular point, but I, I, I felt pretty good about getting 80 percent uh, um, commitment uh, from the beginning. And we are going to continue to work on the barriers to implementation so that we can get even the smaller uh, Internet service providers as soon as possible. All right. Now, to all witnesses, similarly, can and should CISRIC's recommendations be adopted by the FCC or other federal agencies 
and thereby be made mandatory? Please answer yes or no, but I would very much appreciate a written submission explaining your comment. Starting with you, Ms. Alexander. Uh, no. Admiral? No, no sir. Uh, next witness? No. Only when they're supporting data. Uh, next witness? Uh, no, sir. Thank you. And please submit to that to us. I'm sorry to do that to you, but the time here is rather limited. Uh, Ms. Alexander, your testimony focused largely on domain name security extensions. Uh, as you know, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, ICON, has signaled its intention to increase by many fold the number of generic top level domain names. Uh, is NTIA concerned that such expansion may complicate efforts to deploy uh, DNSS? EC, as well as compromise DNSSEC's future effectiveness, yes or no? No, sir. It's a requirement for all new TLDs. Would you submit a, 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 uh, an appropriate uh, further response on that matter? Absolutely. Uh, now, other witnesses, do any of you, starting with you, Admiral, do, uh, care to comment on Ms. Alexander's comments? No, sir. Thank you. Next witness? No comment. Next witness? Any technology that hasn't been deployed for decades may potentially have vulnerabilities, and that's always a fundamental challenge in the age of the Internet. Uh, there are unforeseen uses dec decades down the roll. Uh, leading academics have contributed to DNSSEC. It's one of our best efforts to try and tackle these issues, so I'm confident that uh, it, it will stand the test of time. Ms. Simply? No comment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your courtesy. Thank you. Uh, we'll now go to uh, Ms. Blackburn uh, for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank all of you for your time and for being here. Mr. Hutchison, I want to come to you first and ask you about the program that you all have that you liken to a medical residency in cybersecurity. So what I'd like to know is how that is structured, if you could give us a little bit more detail, is it public-private partnership? Um, and the reason I ask this is because in um, the area that I represent, in um, Tennessee, there around Nashville, we have so many individuals that started working on the entertainment industry platforms and they've moved to defense informatics or over to healthcare informatics and then some of them are in financial service informatics and we see uh, so much sharing on the skills that are there to keep the backbone of the internet safe if you will and I, I think it's fascinating that you all have done something but as we talk about um, having a trained workforce who's able to handle this it sounds like a good idea and I'd love a little detail if you're able to share that. Yes, thank you for that question. Uh, wh what we realized is that technology is nowhere near ready to protect our networks, that it really requires people and it requires creative people who can adapt to, to lacks of technology and tools. When we built this program, we focused on bringing the participants together in a common environment to carefully pair those individuals and team them with mentors and to okay, create let me in stop right there. How do you select individuals for this program? How do you pick them out and select them? Okay, so, so in the early days, we selected them through an application and resume and interview process. Today, there's a lot of referrals. Okay. So we get referrals from people who understand this program. And, and so we place them in this environment. They work together on teams. They work on actual national security problems. They learn security through that experience, they learn all the balances and the gives and takes and, and what makes uh, cybersecurity particularly difficult. And, and as they build these projects out and, and, and make these trade-offs, they just gain the type of instinct that a medical student must also gain in a residency program. Okay. That, that sounds great. Now, any of the graduates of your program, if you will, and I use that just as a, a term to kind of look at those that have come through, how many have come through the program? Uh, so, so I can provide a, an exact number for the record, but okay. it's, it's I, about I think 300. That, okay. That sounds, that sounds wonderful. Um, 
have any of them been helpful going forward in identifying risk or threats to the system or uh, maybe um, writing programs that help to foil any of the threats? What kind of participation and results are you seeing? So, so the people who have been through this program are distributed to industry. Uh, they, they are in government service. They, they work for national labs and, and other FFRDCs. And there are many cases where they have developed tools that were able to identify a particular uh, breach of a network or to develop uh, algorithms that can uh, provide things like directions toward attribution and criminal investigation, digital forensics capability. Th there's a long list of achievements that these okay, so individuals have. So you're seeing have. solid results? Solid results from these okay. individuals. Okay, it sounds great. Uh, this is something I would like to hear from each of you, and I only have one minute left. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we are working on cybersecurity legislation and the question that always comes up is how narrow do you make it or how broad uh, do you make it and I've appreciated hearing uh, your testimonies today. So how narrowly or broadly should federal legislation define what can or cannot be shared between governments and private entities and should there be specific requirements on a PII? about innocent consumers being taken out of data packets before it can be shared with any other government agencies? Um, I, I encourage you to consider uh, legislation in the, that's broad in the sense of uh, supporting people who need to do the right thing uh, in response to uh, incidents. Uh, in terms of uh, more prescriptive approaches, I encourage you to, do, uh, to use uh, uh, data-driven um, and experiment, you know, pol you know, pilots essentially to verify that a policy that's being considered that may be prescriptive is actually going to be a effective. Okay. Go ahead. I would like the opportunity to come back to you um, via technical assistance or others and describe the processes we use in the department today for how to protect privacy and other um, considerations where um, what we're mostly focused on are indicators, the specific technical pieces of information that are useful. And while it is not possible to always avoid in that indicator um, collection of some things that may be of concern, we have strong protection measures in place um, to ensure as we're working to get to the indicators in the malicious code. Excellent. would like to follow up. Thank you. I appreciate that. A yell back. Thanks, gentlelady. And now uh, turn to Mr. Stearns for our final questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think that many of you heard my opening statement uh, talking about Sean Henry, uh, the FBI's top cyber uh, cop. And so I was going to ask each of you, uh, starting you with you, Ms. Alexander, uh, <coughs> Mr. Henry told the Wall Street Journal that we're not winning the cybersecurity battle. He went on to say, quote, we've been playing defense for a long time. You can only build a fence so high. And what we found is that the difference, that the offense outpaces the defense, and the offense is better than the defense. Do you agree or disagree with the assessment of Sean Henry? Uh, thank you much. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Congressman. I'm not familiar with the article or what he said, but I would say it just points to the uh, reason why we're here today and why we're all working so closely across the um, federal government to be vigilant dealing with these issues. Admiral? Uh, yes, sir. I, I would agree with him. Uh, we cannot sustain the way it's going right now. The, the, we have too much of our economy that's now invest, invested in ones and zeros. Uh, there are so many other things, uh, verticals, uh, critical infrastructures that depend on our communication infrastructure to impact it. So we have to take action. And so I think uh, what you've heard here today is uh, a call for that and an answer to your response. We appreciate this hearing to focus on it. Mr. Hutchison? Attackers do have an easier job than, than a defender uh, has, and that, that is problematic, and it is resource depleting. I, I completely agree with the assessment that, uh, that the defenders are, are on the wrong side economically. I mean, it is very easy for an attacker to attack a system and cause a lot of money to be spent in defending that system. But the solution is, is to accept that our networks will never be free of compromise and to find ways that we can operate in the face of compromise. And that is an open research challenge. There is certain progress in that direction, and I would encourage uh, additional you know, support for those forms of research objectives. Dr. Shannon? 
Um, it's a dramatic article. I have not read it. Uh, it's certainly the sort of articles that we've seen for many decades in the area of cybersecurity. Um, they just tend to get more press these days. Uh, you know, I would encourage you to remember that it's about root causes and uh, versus uh, innovation. You know, we all received email this morning, the sky isn't falling. Uh, there are serious, serious challenges, uh, but uh, it, it's, it's easy to get a little carried away in my view. So would you agree with him or not? I don't think it's useful to be so dramatic. Okay. I, that's my personal no, opinion. I, I, after I appreciate your honesty here. After hearing, uh, being with colleagues who were dramatic, you know, 20 years ago about these issues. Okay. Ms. Sim Simply? Uh, thank you, sir, and thank you for the opportunity with this hearing because I think the um, the thematics of that article are certainly what we're talking about today. Um, and as I said, it's, there's no single solution in this situation. And so um, if the premise of the article is that we need to make changes in order to increase awareness and importance of the cybersecurity challenges, then I would agree with that. Okay. Mr. Barnett, Admiral Barnett, um, I think you told Ms. Eshoo earlier that uh, we need to focus on supply chain vulnerabilities. I had a hearing as chairman of the Oversight Investigation Committee yesterday just on that with the Department of Energy. And uh, frankly, they're doing catch-up. Uh, CBO had a report that uh, came out uh, mentioning the Department of Defense and, and the DOE is, admits that they just started looking at ways to uh, look at cybersecurity in their supply chains. So I was wondering if you had anything you'd like to elaborate on the supply chain vulnerabilities. Well, at, at the FCC, we've been looking at this for the two years that I've been there, and I know we've been working with other governmental partners on this. Uh, one of the things that's uh, apparent as we look across the authorities, uh, for whatever else you can, you can say about it, is the authorities we have right now were not designed to address the supply chain challenges that we have right now, so additional work needs to continue. There are a couple approaches that I hear uh, going on. One is a kind of a transactional approach. Uh, one I think I'm uh, intending to favor better right now is a supply chain risk management where it's a tiered approach and the most critical elements of our communications network are provided the most protection uh, and that allows a little bit more flexibility as you go down to the other tiers. There are a lot of tools that are available to us that we may include uh, very stand supply chain standards. The, the, the government needs to work together on this to pull it together and we can't start soon enough. Mr. Hutchinson, according to you, your president and director, Paul Homart, Sandia National Laboratory has been attacked up to 30,000 times per hour. Do some of these attacks get through your safety net? Does Sandia National Laboratories currently have supply chain checks in place with equipment that you buy? Okay, the attacks that, uh, that lab director Homart is referring to are not supply chain attacks per se, but uh, but just operational attacks against our cyber networks. And they're measured that way because we have successfully identified that as an attack and, and stopped it before it affected our systems. Mm -hmm. And that said, we have instances where we detect compromises that occurred on our systems and we investigate and, and, uh, and address those as we discover them. And yes, we do have very careful supply chain uh, processes that we follow because our prime mission of building weapons um, has been a victim or has been a target, not a victim, a target of supply chain attacks for many years. So we have uh, developed our engineering and science capabilities to address those issues. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman for his questions. Uh, seeing no other members uh, to ask questions. Thank you very much for your testimony, for your answers to your question, and the good work you're doing to make America safer and more secure. We appreciate it uh, in this role and in other roles that you've had. And I thank the uh, subcommittee members for their partic participation. Um, and uh, we will continue on this topic, although I don't see future hearings at the moment uh, planned. But we will be in, in contact with you, and I know some of our colleagues had questions for you to follow up on, so we appreciate your written responses to those. And any other suggestions you have for us, we want to get this right, and it's, uh, there's too much at stake not to. So we appreciate your help, and I appreciate the participation of the committee. And with that, we stand adjourned.